This week on Arizona Illustrated, reopening. I'm really amazed at how much work we have. I mean, we're already booked for all this week. The Sugar Hill neighborhood. Sugar Hill has definitely been targeted more because it is a black neighborhood. We're the Sugar Hill Coalition. We're trying to get our community back. Art interrupted. The emails, emails, like millions of emails. And then the next day, it's like thesis is being postponed. My heart just sank. And we go to Gleason, Arizona. It's very strange to see it because back when I was younger, there was people everywhere. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Businesses and employees across the country have felt the impact of the economic shutdown brought on by the coronavirus pandemic. Unemployment numbers continue to rise at an unprecedented rate, hitting workers and employers across all sectors. As Arizona begins to reopen, we spoke with two small business owners in Tucson to get their take on this new normal. Grocery stores, home improvement stores, they're jam-packed with people. You know, the only social distancing are the people that are in line. But if you're not in line, you're fighting crowds. And, you know, I feel like restaurants got the short end of the stick because it's still perceived or seen as a luxury. So um, we're taking the, the necessary precautions, you know, following the governor's orders. We're separating all the tables, putting up splash shields everywhere, hand sanitizer dispensers disinfecting all the doors, anything that gets touched by the public. So we're, we're gonna plant a flag to be a safe place to eat. We were doing really, really great until all this epidemic came and then they shut us down. So we were, we were out of work. So that was kind of scary coming back because we didn't know if we were still gonna have the business or not. So it, it's very hard because you wanna be supportive with the community. You wanna keep everybody safe. You want our stylists to be safe. I mean, I, I want my girls to be safe but it, it's hard. It's hard too when the bills start coming in. It, it's hard when you have to pay the rent, when everything else, you know, and you don't have the money because the business is not coming in. So I'm, I'm happy because the customers have been very supportive and because it hasn't been too, too hard for them to follow the protocol. Just setting up appointments, you know, a little bit set apart so we can have the time to sanitize, to clean up, and it, it's just adjusting to a whole new routine to keep everybody safe. While many merchants are getting back to business, hundreds of others have decided to wait over concerns that now is not a safe time to reopen. They call their effort Too Soon Arizona. To find out more, visit TooSoonArizona.com. Sugar Hill, an historically black neighborhood, has experienced considerable change with the growth of Tucson. Gentrification and student housing have begun to alter its character and the future of its residents, many of whom have fond memories of its heyday. Sadie Shaw is working to keep those memories alive by collecting oral histories from longtime residents and hoping to preserve the community for generations to come. Jackie Blue, thank you for sitting with me and um bringing me into your home for this interview. My pleasure. I usually start out by asking the interviewee to state your name and also tell us your mother's name and your father's name. Okay. My name is Jack Anderson, Jr. My father's name is Jack Anderson. My mother's name is Neres Anderson, N-E-R-E-S. And they uh, all migrated out of Texas. As long as I got something to tell you, I'm going to tell it to you if you want to hear it. Because nobody's been telling this Sugar Hill story right. I was born and raised in Tucson. I didn't come from nowhere else. I was born and raised right here in this desert, right here. Used to play in the barefoot summer heat. That's how we used to do. Sugar Hill has always been the name that this area has been called by the locals and people who grew up in the neighborhood or the surrounding areas. Sugar Hill neighborhood is one of Tucson's historic black neighborhoods. People 
people started moving in uh, late 40s, early 50s, around the time that the city decided to redline this area for black homeowners. My grandpa came here in the 50s, brought his family along from East St. Louis, and yeah, we've been here ever since. Sugar Hill is a name that's given to many black communities all over the country. It refers to a black neighborhood that's kind of up and coming. My family moved over here in 1960. I was four years old when we moved over here. I was born in this neighborhood. I was born in 1961 in this neighborhood. My parents and the parents before me, they're the ones that built the community. And they built a rich community, faith-based community. Every, most of the people went to church. It was one of the middle-class neighborhoods where a lot of professionals lived. Um, there was a lot of military families. There was, um, you know, principals, teachers, doctors. All right, Sugar Hill, let's do something. Can we make some noise up in here? Can we make some noise? What it did was foster neighborhoods that became united and achieved historic things. We're the Sugar Hill Coalition. We're trying to get our community back. From the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, everything was very close-knit. To my brothers and sisters from Sugar Hill, welcome. Unfortunately, the drug epidemic hit, and that literally destroyed a lot of people. You know, a lot of people went to prison, a lot of people got addicted to drugs, a lot of people died. You know, a lot of people lost their homes. Some people lost their homes behind that. Unfortunately, that's what happened. Hey, I'm Jackie Blue. God bless you. I know folks, that because of those times and those days, some of them uh, just getting out of the penitentiary. You know, been done all that time. And that's who I'm talking to in my music. I'm talking to the people that was right out there with me, whether it's uh, fighting a revolution or selling drugs in the street. The goal of the Sugar Hill Oral History Project is to make visible the history of the neighborhood, the lives of the people who, who lived here and who still live here. and just to increase the awareness of um, the neighborhood and the black community in Tucson. My mother came out to support her aunt, found a job. My father, on the other hand, a little bit of a different story. He came here with qualified papers to be a heavy equipment operator to build homes or to build highways. And he was putting in applications everywhere and he couldn't get a job. Till finally somebody, one of his friends, told him that, man, they're putting your application at the bottom of the list. You will never get hired because you're black. He could get a job as a, as a janitor, which is what he did. So he was an angry man deep down inside because he had to spend most of his life doing work that he didn't like to do. When it comes to racism, segregation, and oppression, I think it's, you know, similar in all areas of the country. Uh, everything you see internationally happened here, locally, on a smaller scale. Students rioting. I've had people get shot by the police. You know, relatives get shot by the police. I don't think it's vastly different from living in the South. Maybe you weren't going to get lynched, but, you know, there's still all kinds of oppression and, you know, places where you had to stay and jobs that you couldn't get. As long as I can remember, I always wanted to play a guitar. 
I used to imagine that I would take a shoebox, get a rubber band, and a stick off the chinaberry tree, and make me a guitar. Wow. Yeah. What's your style of, of or your process of, of writing these songs? Um, um, specifically, the party at the bro. Did you write that mm -hmm. when the bro was still around, mm -hmm. or did it come after? A few years before. The Folk Rummel was a social club. I don't think it was just black people, but I think it was mostly black people. I used to go there with my dad sometimes during the day and, and hang out. It's been torn down now, and I think that people are still kind of upset about that. I could just see how it was going and how we lost so many places like the bro. Um, yeah, I wrote that because I experienced that. Jackie Blue's music is kind of like a historical timeline of um, Tucson's black communities. When did the neighborhood start to change? Like it is now? Yeah, when did it become like a black community into something different? And, and what do you think caused that? Time brings about a change. So a lot of that I attribute to time. I chose this one to kind of really um, show the world like what gentrification has done to the neighborhood. I mean, if you look to your right, look to your left. These are houses um, that developers came in, bought up. The whole block is student houses now. Sugar Hill has definitely been targeted more because it is a black neighborhood. Feldman's neighborhood to the south, Jefferson Park to the east, they all have historic designation status. You know, Sugar Hill does not. At the end, what I call at the end of the, of the battle, right, because we, we lost it. I ain't say it's over, but we lost it. I called one of these numbers and, you know, asked if I could stay there, if I could live there, and I was told that this wasn't a good neighborhood for me to stay in because I have a daughter. It's just kind of sad that uh, some of the things, most lot of stuff we fought for is cool. Some of it is just, and the people that fought for it, they, you know, nobody knows about them. Nobody cares. That's the thing, nobody really cares. Yeah, I can tell them about them, but okay. My main purpose working with the Neighborhood Association was to, to bring light to the historic residents, um, the history of it, and just to make, um, make the neighborhood visible again and in, the, in the real way that you know, it was in the past. This is the University of Arizona Museum of Art, where Bachelor of Arts and Master of Fine Arts students were planning to exhibit their culminating thesis work. The shows here are some of the most anticipated and meaningful events in the lives of students who attend the School of Art, work that they have spent all year and in some cases many years to create. It's a crucial time for these young artists as they hope to break into the art world. The coronavirus pandemic upended these shows and forced students and faculty to adapt. So this is a quick tour starting at the very front of my apartment. Begin with just a messy studio table over here. Here's my studio space. My name is Kenzie Wells. I am a third year in the Masters of Fine Arts program here at the University of Arizona. And my predicament is <laughs> that um, my thesis show for graduation that I've been working on this entire year has been uh, questionably canceled, but as of right now, it's postponed. I basically have a wall of 
art supplies serving as a divider between <laughs> my studio and my uh, bed. The MFA show is an, always a, a wildly ambitious endeavor. I've been here four and a half years. Every year I've been really impressed with the students' ability to bring forward really large-scale projects in exciting ways. The planning starts six or seven months ahead of the actual exhibitions. Our joy in it, whether your staff, faculty, or community members, is being able to see the accomplishments of these students. They're different beasts, for sure. The BFA show is huge. There's roughly, I think, 141 works and about 80 artists. My name is Fabiola. I'm a um, BFA undergrad student um, in photography. This semester, I was getting into the four by five. But with digital, um, I'm kind of in a more like exploring kind of phase where I'm trying to see what kind of digital photographer I am. I really wanted to be able to have the interaction of the community to see how they took my artwork and kind of just bring my mom and my son and have a picture taken together by my work so it'd be like a memory to cherish. The conversations about the university moving to online learning actually happened, I think, the Friday before work was scheduled to be dropped off to the BFA exhibition. We utilized the images from the actual console um, to construct a website and try and uh, make it so that it was a layered experience for uh, viewers and the students so that they could see uh, their work in tandem with other students' work in sort of a, a virtual gallery. Right now, I expected to be actually at this moment um, in, in the museum installing my thesis show. Which is kind of like the culmination of what we work toward um, as grad students. The thesis show for grad students in the School of Art is like, it's the dissertation. Like, that's the point. <laughs> This developed so rapidly and the news was changing so much every day. So it just kept unfolding, like we got new information every day. Suddenly we start getting these emails. The emails, emails, like millions of emails. And then the next day, you know, it's like thesis is being postponed. Every day it was worse. The day after that, it's like we have to close the studios. My heart just sank. But the issue is since we lost access, we weren't really finished. So part of the problem is actually finishing the work. <laughs> My work is shaped by um, my synesthesia. For my thesis project, um, I am basically translating images into interpretable musical scores. The nature of MFA programs, and especially the one that I'm in, they really do encourage you to think in an interdisciplinary format and to have it be something where it's very experiential. Um, like, for example, I was even going to have certain musicians actually physically there performing. My thesis work, which um, for me specifically has been, you know, a culmination of three years worth of work, was working with the env environmental science uh, program specifically their wildlife biology program and they're tracking wildlife migration across the US-Mexico border. And so it's been an incredible three years kind of working with them and working with the photo faculty and thinking of different ways of looking at how science and art can live together. It was gonna be in this isolated gallery that was going to be very sensorial. Oftentimes I feel like my work can't really fully be experienced unless it's all together in one space. And I'm often painting the walls too, to kind of just really create a scene. So having human presence and human touch interact with the work pushes it into a, such a stronger realm. The work itself has been worked on for almost a year now, but the kind of thinking and framework behind it has been three years of work. <laughs> yeah. You have to acknowledge the disappointment, right, that happens 
as a result of realizing that certain plans are, are, are not going to be able to come to fruition in the way that they were originally imagined. But then, you know, resiliency, creativity, both of which I think are built into the very fabric of the arts, are really critical in these sorts of situations. Is art changing in a way where we'll need to reach people through kind of online instead? And how do you do that with that type of work, I think, um, is a question that I'm asking. In the art world, it's all about standing out to some extent. And in one way, like, we'll always be that year, you know, that cohort or that year that had this really bizarre, you know, moment in time and we had to deal with it. If there's one thing I've gathered, it's that right now the world really wants art. <laughs> Arizona's more than 200 ghost towns enjoy a rich history with names like Angel Camp, Gold Road, and Ruby. But there's one abandoned mining town near Tombstone that's being kept alive by a former resident, a Vietnam veteran who lived there as a child with no running water or electricity. His name is Joe Bono. <laughs> Gleason was a mining community, had about 1,500 people. Not all of them were miners, but the majority of them were uh, miners here. It was uh, discovered because there was turquoise here. John Gleason, being a mining engineer, he knew where you found turquoise, you found copper. And he mined uh, copper, silver, gold, and some turquoise. This was my dad's uh, store slash uh, saloon. I lived here for five, six years when I was a youngster. Uh, we lived on the backside. We didn't have uh, running water or electricity at the time. All we used was the kerosene lamps. So we did what we could. A lot of good memories, people uh, coming up, you know, and uh, they used to ride their horses up here and uh, park them out here in front and not be playing out in front and it, it was a good time. It's very strange to see it because back when I was here, living here, when I was younger, there was people everywhere. You could go every part of town, you know, and visit the store, visit the Chinese restaurant. It had a theater, had a post office. So there was a lot of mingling with people, just different uh, groups of people out here. My dad came from Italy. And my mom came from Mexico. And I always say I was raised under both beautiful cultures because of the food and knowing how to speak the languages. It was great. I come through because my uncle's buried at the cemetery and I'll stop by and uh, take care of his grave. And I happen to see a for sale sign in the area and uh, I actually had to turn around and come back and get the phone number and call the lady that was selling it. I told her who I was and she asked if I was from the original Bono family that lived here and I told her yeah and she says we got to talk. So that's how I acquired it actually. Just brought back all these uh, memories of uh, the Gleason and its heydays and all the people that lived here and of course I lived here so I, I just had to come by it. <laughs> And this is the Gleason Jail Museum that I maintain and keep up as much as I can. This is uh, where they used to hold the prisoners here in Gleason Jail when it was getting too rowdy. Oh. 
glad I did it because my grandkids are enjoying it now, and people come out and uh, they get to enjoy what used to be, you know. And it's nice and quiet, peaceful, and, and people just love it. Yeah, I mean, they grew up here, you know, my dad had the saloon store over there, and the rest is history. My dad came from Italy when he was 15 years old. It's always good to hear your family history. It's always nice to know what your grandparents, great-grandparents did to make you, to raise you, what they had to go through to get where they are now. So my dad had uh, this calendar inside the store, and uh, it had a little calendar down here and a thermometer on there that was always in the store and gave the Joe Bono uh, general merchandise store. And you were the model? Yes, I, I, I modeled for that. <laughs> My mom, she used to go help the miners pick these pebbles out of their eyes. I guess she only, she was the only one that had tweezers in town. So they would call her at night when they got off work. And I, I would take the lantern and hold the lantern for her over the people so she could see and pick out these things. And these miners would be screaming and, and I'd be all nervous and shaken because they're screaming it, you know. But I, I was the one that had to have, hold the light for her. How old are you? I was about uh, six, seven years old at the time. And uh, for me to be able to hold the light, you know, it was very scary. You know, I wasn't really interested in this place when I was a teenager. And now that I'm a little bit older, I am here 100% of the time, helping him, letting him take a break from the tours and giving them myself so he doesn't have to worry about it. For my kids, I'm definitely gonna bring them out here. They will definitely know exactly where they came from. I've thought about uh, uh, my final resting place here in Gleason because it's always been a joy for me. It was a great place growing up, I'm sure I'm hoping that it's a great place to lay down in and enjoy it too. I love it. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Stay safe and we'll see you next week.